Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Mabel and Jandri. Great job. Uh, it's wonderful. And I hope that our book will be downloaded two million times so that it spreads our faith. Um, first of all, uh, it's wonderful to follow Greg. Uh, uh, last time I was in Europe was in February 2020, and I met Greg in Berlin. And the two of us on the side were very busy trying to organize medical equipment and masks to be shipped to Wuhan um, and uh, how times have changed. Um, how times have changed also now t a couple of times we heard 50 years uh, Nixon uh, in, in China uh, and uh, I was privileged to have dinner with Henry Kissinger in October in 89 and I said to him uh, yeah what was your biggest worry when you were uh, here in, in Daoita in Beijing he said well it was my shirt uh, because I just realized when I gave it to the laundry that all my shirts had a label in the back that says made in Taiwan um, <laughs> So I'm very privileged also that uh, it's uh, Springer uh, Publishing Trust because uh, it is uh, headquartered in Heidelberg in Germany. It's my hometown. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful to be a part of that uh, success story. They have been globalizing extremely well. So wonderful. Um, uh, myself, I have my own anniversary this year. Exactly 40 years ago, I arrived here by train from, from Heidelberg, as a matter of fact and had been privileged to be part of the biggest economic comeback story uh, the world has ever seen. Uh, now, the European Chamber is an organization across uh, China with nine offices and 1,800 members. And of course, we represent, we are the, the advocacy, uh, we are complementary to the bilateral chambers. And um, I must say that uh, uh, we, we don't match the output of CCG. Uh, the number of books that Henry brings out is just mind blogging uh, but uh, we, we, we match it by size. Uh, we have a position paper uh, that comes out always in September. It's a magnificent 430 pages. Last September, we had 900 recommendations uh, for the Chinese government. And the size and the number of recommendations just tells you how difficult still market access is in China. So I hope that this book can contribute to the fact that the leadership realizes that it's better to win with us than rather to exclude us. Now, uh, the right conditions are, uh, are covered there. I mean, the right conditions are obviously the, the growth potential of China. And uh, in my daytime job, I'm heading a German chemical company, BASF. Um, and uh, we have already put a couple of billions into the ground, but we have now under construction a massive plant in Guangdong province. We signed it in 2018. It's a $10 billion investment. And tellingly enough, we were permitted to have that as a 100% entity, which was a big leap forward. We hope that China will not constrain equity concerns, foreign, uh, foreign partners with Chinese, but leave it up to the investors how they structure this best. Um, and so commitment is definitely on our side. And uh, we will start the first unit in Zhangjiang uh, uh, this, month, this month, next month. Um, first of all, of course, trade does well between Europe and China. I think we're the largest trading partners. But at the same time, if you look behind the numbers, you can actually see that China is benefiting greatly from the consumption of the European population. Um, of course, uh, China produces exactly what you need in the lockdown position. position. Um, and exports, uh, in, in particular the last quarter of 2021, uh, rose from China to Europe uh, by 30%. Um, and it's, I guess, about 1.2, 1.3 billion euro a, a day. Um, uh, European uh, exports to uh, China have actually leveled out. Uh, two of three months uh, of the last quarter were actually negative, and uh, one month was 4% growth. So basically, we are we flat in our exports. Uh, I don't know if we became less competitive, if we have uh, more market restrictions, but it's something to ponder. So if you hear that we are the biggest trading partners, it just means that China actually trade-wise depends more than two times more as much on Europe as we depend on, on China. As a matter of fact, just because <coughs> Martin is here uh, from the Swiss Chamber, five years ago, we exported more as European Union to Switzerland than into the People's Republic of China. So trade is something we definitely have to improve. Trade combines people, gives choices, and uh, we hope that uh, there will be something. Now, two words on uh, transitional opportunity. I think the big one on transition definitely is pandemic. Um, when transit in Europe and other places uh, from having this uh, as, as a, a pandemic into uh, a, looking at uh, COVID as a disease, as a normal flu in a way. In my own country, Germany, yesterday we had 200,000 cases. Um, and uh, I think about 20, 25% of our population already had COVID. Uh, we have very good vaccine. BioNTech comes from mines in Germany. 
Um, and so we have reached a very high level of herd immunity. Uh, other countries actually did more or less the same. So they will come back to normal at one stage. And the challenge, of course, will be for China having zero tolerance. There is no herd immunity. Uh, vaccine, which is more on the weak side. Uh, there will be a massive challenge uh, how to transit and how to exit that mode. Um, I have uh, stopped lobbying the Chinese government on opening the borders. I think personally it would be irresponsible for China to open the borders at this stage because the protection level, the immunity level in the population is way too low. Um, and we really have to step up and do more uh, in, in, in letting um, mRNA into the country, develop faster the Chinese vaccine as well as uh, try to make sure that the country can actually eventually safely open. But we will not get rid of COVID. Let's not kid ourselves globally. Then, of course, um, in, in opportunities. Well, in the position paper in September, we had a very good uh, study from the World Bank in there uh, that shows how uh, four economies were developing uh, over the last 40 years of opening up. Um, uh, and you can see that actually Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and People's Republic from the year of opening up, which of course Japan 50s, uh, Taiwan 60s, 70s for Korea, and uh, late 1980 for the Chinese economy. Actually, the growth model was similar. Uh, it's very telling that actually these other economies grew at the same space, at the same uh, uh, pace. Uh, so nothing unusual there. But of course, China's everything is one point times 1.4 billion, and that makes uh, all the difference. But what we also see from the chart is that China has been falling behind GDP per capita in PPP terms from the other three economies uh, while they were in their 40th, 40th year. And that's something that worries us. We want China to succeed. And the World Bank did uh, three studies for us, three scenarios. One is muddling through, basically doing what China has been doing over the last years, a little bit opening there, otherwise uh, staying autark uh, in other areas, as well as uh, one scenario where China relies, uh, does self-reliance, uh, the theme of our position paper, China actually trying to withdraw from the world. We also published a paper on decoupling uh, last year, uh, something that worries us. Uh, and then the third scenario was China uh, opening up, uh, linking up, uh, be more in globalization. And the three scenarios clearly show that in all three areas, China will grow. There is no China uh, slow grow uh, uh, mode in there, but there are three distinctive features. Uh, one is, of course, China, it, that last year was $16,800 PPP uh, terms, and uh, China, in the worst case, will double that by 2050. Um, and the difference is it will just about reach Japan levels in about 20 years from now, but Taiwan and Korea will be far away GDP per capita. Um, and then you have the modeling through, that means that sort of they go above Japan, but stay behind the other two. And then China opening up, globalizing, actually it takes off like a rocket. Uh, it overtakes the Japanese uh, figures very fast. Uh, it reaches um, uh, at one stage uh, the uh, GDP per capita of Taiwan uh, economy, as well as then eventually bypasses Korea. So it's in China's choice. And of course, we as business people would like to see China having the bigger and stronger growth pattern. The difference between the best case and 2050 and basically the self-reliance case is the staggering 22,500 US dollars per capita that actually China misses out if they go for self-reliance. 22,500 times 1.4 is a hell of a lot of demand missing out for all of us in there. So the way it's China's choice, it's not our choice. We recommend opening up and we are very happy to do this in the center of globalization where Henry is actually advocating this. Thank you very much.